Well, good evening, everyone. It's a great delight to be here. I think we should give these guys a round of applause. That was awesome worship this evening, and it's just such a thrill to be able to gather together with such a large number of Christians and just raise our praise and our worship to our Lord God. I want to thank Carl and the organising committee for the opportunity to come here this evening and to be able to share with you across this weekend. Who's looking forward to the weekend? Anybody? Yep, one or two of you, that's great. <laughs> There is so much that uh, I'm looking forward to being able to share with you and uh, likewise uh, Rod Walsh uh, tomorrow at one o'clock and then uh, Craig Russell on Sunday. And it's our very great privilege to be able to be a part of a ministry that encourages people to have confidence in God's word. And in this day and age it seems there's a, a great need for us to know that we stand with confidence on the truth of God's word. So this evening I want to share with you a little bit of my life's journey, I guess. I've shared a little bit with Carl already. But um, as you're aware, I spent a good deal of my professional working life, um, before working for CMI that is, in the aerospace industry. And uh, I worked for Optus, who owns and operates the Australian National Satellite System. Now, I know that uh, a lot of you here tonight will have Telstra phones, and I'm happy to pray with you after the session. Uh, no, no, just, just kidding. Um, <laughs> but working in the aerospace industry was indeed a great thrill. I was very, very blessed to be able to um, use the skills that God had given me and the opportunities for training and research. And uh, I worked in the area of antenna design, and that involved me in working with the, uh, the spacecraft for Australia. This is a picture of uh, one of them, the Optus C1 satellite. It's being prepared for the launch, which uh, took place in French Guiana on the east coast of South America, just north of Brazil. And you can see it's all folded up. It's this black thing here, all wrapped up in thermal blankets, and this apparatus down here is just for transporting it. And uh, here it's being uh, slung by a crane and uh, fitted onto an adapter which then goes onto the launch vehicle. Now, when one launches a communication satellite, it's quite a, uh, a heart-stopping moment because after some four or so years of uh, design work and construction and detailed uh, measurements and testing, it all then sits there on top of this enormous firecracker and uh, you hope that all goes well. Now, I want to play you a video clip of the launch of the C-1 satellite. Now, the Ariane Spass um, company that operates the launch vehicle is a French-European consortium, so a lot of the uh, words you'll hear in the background are in French, so if any, any French speakers here tonight? Yep, a few of you, can, if you can count to ten, you'll hear the countdown as it comes up. And uh, I want to just point out a few things about the launch as it goes on. This is really fun stuff. So here we are turning the clock back to June 03 when the Optus C1 satellite was launched. Right, so you'll have engine lighting up, then the boosters will check out, then seven Attention seconds later. The video. Attention for the final. final countdown. We'll be back after clearing the tower. Nine, 745 eight, tons. 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. You see the liquid motors fire up and at seven seconds Ooh. the solids will fire, those strap-on boosters at the side, there they go. Then the whole thing lifts off. Up. Décollage. Only now does the sound reach the control centre, which is called Jupiter. It's about six kilometres away from the launch pad. Very impressive shots of those extremely powerful engines roaring up into the night, disappearing now into the clouds, but we should have another camera following them. We had a clearer sky than we thought because we had a lot of rain this morning. But you can see those two boosters and the core stage burning. The DDO saying everything is normal on board. Launcher being tracked now by our cameras here. Those flames making quite a noise, a noise just coming rumbling over Jupiter now from 14 kilometers away. 
The two boosters will burn for about two minutes, and they are burning each one about 240, 240 tons of solid fuel each. And they're going to burn, uh, they provide 90, 90% of the thrust for Ariane. Without them, we can't lift Ariane, off. Them. Ariane is burning four tons of That's solid propellant per second. Do you that four the tons a second? The trajectory is okay. That's fuel consumption. So the boosters will, uh, will fall down into the Atlantic Ocean. Look at this number separation. down the bottom, it's the speed now, on the left in kilometers hand side of the screen, per second. There's some numbers and some letters that you could perhaps explain for us. It's, what is that, speed and... Yes, that's the elevation of the trajectory, the altitude and velocity, and also the, the uh, inertial reference unit which, uh, upon which the uh, data are Two calculated kilometers by second. the onboard computer. On the upper left, you see the cursor crawling up the screen to something that says SEP EAP, which will be booster separation, and you'll hear the DDO call that milestone out. Now, if you watch here, you'll see the two points of light start to separate. That's when those two solid rocket boosters are jettisoned, and uh, then the launch vehicle continues on its way. There they go, fairing out. So. That's a pretty spectacular process, and uh, when you're a part of that um, and experience it, it really is quite amazing. So the launch vehicle injects the satellite into this um, elliptical orbit, and then at the furthest point called the apogee, onboard engines are fired, and it slowly and progressively circularizes this orbit by speeding the satellite up at the apogee. So it ends up in a circular orbit, traveling at about three kilometers a second, to be able to keep pace with the rotation of the Earth. Now, at the correct altitude, at that speed, the satellite appears to be fixed in the sky. That's why the dishes you see around the, the place are fixed dishes. Has anyone got one of those little dishes on your rooftop? You've seen the ones I mean, little grey ones, about that big. They receive things like Foxtel, Ostar, ABC, SBS, the commercial networks and so on. Now, you should understand that I have no accountability whatsoever for what comes over the satellite, all right? I hope you understand that. But I did have a lot to do with the design of those spacecraft themselves. Now, sometimes things go wrong. And uh, in spite of the design effort and care taken, uh, you can have some spectacular failures. And this is a submarine-launched missile and uh, if you look closely, you'll see there's a, a bit of ejection coming out of the side of the nozzle. So the nozzle has failed and some of the exhaust is coming out sideways, which is causing that missile to go into a spiral. And uh, just there, you might be able to see the uh, conning tower of the submarine. There's some very worried submariners in that submarine. One of our satellites didn't quite make it. After 48 seconds in the, uh, the liftoff procedure, there was a blinding flash. It was a nighttime launch, and uh, all went very quiet. And uh, then over the ensuing days, uh, this was launched in China, this particular one, uh, various peasant farmers downrange of the launch vehicle were bringing bits of debris back in, and uh, we collected something like 70% of the, of the spacecraft remains. Um, and uh, people were being paid a US, one US dollar per kilogram of, uh, of debris. So we actually thought that might be a good basis for pricing spacecraft in future, but the manufacturers wouldn't be a part of that. <laughs> now when the C-1 satellite ends up on orbit, there's a complicated process whereby it's then unpacked. You see it's all folded down to the minimum possible space, and then these solar panels unfold, one each side, uh, it's quite a high-powered spacecraft. It needs lots of energy from the sun to operate it. And here you see the other side beginning to deploy. And then when they're deployed, the communication antennas, which receive signals from the Earth and transmit them back down again, uh, will be opened up. And there are four of those. Uh, the four you'll see here, these two on this side. Hopefully it'll come back. There it is. Um, are for the commercial communication services. They're the ones that give you the pay TV services and what have you. Uh, the Optus C1 program was a joint venture with the Department of Defense and Optus. And so there are defense communications uh, antennas and what have you on the top face there, which you'll see those in a moment, um, how they deploy. This one is a very high frequency antenna. And uh, this one, the next one, is a very low frequency antenna designed for communicating with soldiers direct from the spacecraft to a backpack. 
So now that you've seen some U uh, Australian military communications equipment, no one is allowed to leave the room. No, no, it's not really, it's not like that at all. <laughs> but you know, it's very obvious, isn't it, that a communications satellite is the result of design. Now, if you told me that the Optus satellites got up there by accident, then I think I'd be a little bit miffed, uh, as would um, several hundred other scientists and engineers who put a great deal of time and effort into designing and manufacturing and now operating those spacecraft. And yet, in our society, we are told that something like a monarch butterfly came about by chance. And yet, the monarch butterfly is vastly more complicated than a communication spacecraft, which after all is really quite simple, believe it or not. You see, the monarch butterfly is able to reproduce itself. How extraordinary. Man has never yet invented a machine which can reproduce itself. So why would we assume that something as stunningly complex and beautiful as a monarch butterfly came about by chance? But you know, that's what we are told. That's what we're told on TV documentaries, our science curriculum tells us that, high school, university. It's all a random process called evolution. Now, if you were walking along a beach and you saw a random distribution of pebbles in the sand like that, you wouldn't be particularly surprised, would you? You might think to yourself, well, you know, just the random action of wind and waves on the sand and these pebbles are there. But what if you saw this? Would you still think the same? <laughs> now, you'd look at that and think, well, hang on a minute. Obviously, there's been an external intelligence which has acted on those pebbles to arrange them that way. But how do you know that there's an external intelligence involved? Because you can't see that external intelligence, all you can see are the pebbles. Well, one of the reasons we know is that it's a very unlikely arrangement of pedals, pebbles. But that's not sufficient, because you could argue any arrangement is unlikely. But importantly, it complies with a predetermined code. So if you see a circle of things with two dots, a nose and a mouth, you know it symbolises a face. Now, pebbles don't naturally organise themselves into faces. I mean, if that was true, when you went down to the beach nest, you see all these faces looking up at you, right? But it isn't like that, is it? So we know full well that there has been a, an intelligent agent acting there. In fact, archaeology as a discipline depends upon the archaeologist's ability to recognise intelligent intervention, like in this figurine. And this vase of flowers. Now, we all know that the vase was obviously made, but, you know, it's very simple. It just consists of silicon dioxide. It's really not very complicated at all. But we're told that the flowers came about by chance. And yet the flowers are vastly more complicated than the vase. But is intelligent design a scientific concept? Well, some of the scientists would have us believe no. And uh, this is from Berkeley University, and they say that intelligent design itself is not testable and so cannot be validated by the central method of science, testing ideas against evidence from the natural world. Well, I wonder, is that really so? For instance, if you were a geologist and you were exploring South Dakota around Mount Rushmore and you came upon the four presidential heads, now, would you recognise design or would you think to yourself, what an amazing process of erosion by wind and rain and what have you must have taken millions of years to make those presidents' heads? You see, specified shapes like that face in the pebbles are the products of intelligent, not intelligence rather, not natural processes. I came across here on uh, an aircraft, I live in Sydney, and uh, for instance a, a Boeing 747, it wasn't that, it was an Airbus actually, but it has over five million non-flying parts. Not one of the bits it's made of will fly, but you put them all together and it flies. You see, that is an indicator of intelligence. When you look at a single cell, it is staggeringly complex. I'm going to share some of the complexities with you tonight and tomorrow night as well when we talk about biology. It consists of billions of non-living parts, proteins and what have you. But assembled together, they form a self-replicating cell. 
and yet we're told that we cannot admit design into biology. Francis Crick, who was one of the co-discoverers of the helical structure of the DNA molecule, said in this book, biologists must constantly keep in mind that what they see was not designed, but rather evolved. Now, why do you think they have to constantly keep it in mind? Because constantly, as we examine biological systems, we see the unmistakable imprint of a designer. So they've got to keep reminding themselves, oh, no, no, it's not designed, it's the result of an accident. It doesn't make much sense, does it? You know, the Bible tells us in Romans 1.20 that God's invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. I like this little cartoon, the two snowmen talking to each other. Don't be absurd, nobody made us. We evolved by chance from snowflakes. But you know, this is put forward very seriously and back in 1859, Charles Darwin published his now very famous book, The Origin of Species by Natural Selection. It had a rather politically incorrect subtitle, The Preservation of Favoured Races in the Struggle for Life. But Darwin put forward the idea that all life originated from some original primordial cell, which perhaps formed accidentally in some warm little pond, as he put it, and then through random actions acted on by natural selection, we have all of these different branches depicting all the diversity of living things that we see in the world around us. And of course, culminating with mankind up here at the top of the pile after many millions of years. But how do we know whether something is designed? So let's take another look at this satellite. I think there are three key things that give away evidence for design. And the first of those is the presence of information. Now, by that I mean specified complexity, like the face in the pebbles. So when uh, the communication spacecraft is being assembled, there are assembly instructions which are prepared carefully by the engineers that describe uh, how the component parts have to be made and then how they have to be integrated together and assembled. In the much the same way, living organisms can be thought of as having assembly instructions. And if you were to take uh, the information, say, to make a single-celled bacterium, you could write all the assembly instructions down and fill a book. It might be a, like a 500-page book. But if you wanted to make something more complicated, like a horse, then you'd need a lot more information. Now you need instructions about how to make heart, lungs, eyes, bones, muscles, hair, all the rest of it. So you need many, many more books full of information. Now, all of that information uh, is stored on the DNA molecule. But what does information mean? Well, well, let me try and explain it a little bit like this. Uh, if you want to transmit information, let's say, uh, here am I and there are you, and something arises in my mind which I then want to impart to you. So what I do is I encode that information. So right now, I'm encoding it as speech. Now, I have to use predetermined rules of grammar. You can't tell if I'm spelling the words correctly because that doesn't work with speech, but if I wrote to you, then I'd have to use the correct uh, uh, conventions for spelling. I then transmit the information. Right now I'm doing it by sound, but I could send you a letter or a note. You then decode the information, but to be able to decode it, you must have the same predetermined rules of spelling and grammar. And you must have it in advance before I start to communicate. Otherwise, we won't be able to communicate. So hopefully the information that arises in your mind is approximately the same that arose in mine and the communication uh, channel has then been completed. But you see, you need to have that predetermined code, don't you? So here's some examples of uh, predetermined codes. Here are four letters. Now, because uh, I'm I speak English, I know what that means, and it conjures up the um, image of uh, a, a present, a gift. But uh, if I was German, it means something very different. Does anybody know what it means in German? Anyone? Yes? Poison. It means poison, doesn't it? So after the war, German postal workers were very nervous about handling packages from England with GIFT written on them. And what about these four letters? Now, to me, because I speak English, it conjures up the image of a casual conversation over a cup of coffee. But what if I spoke French? What would it mean then? 
A cat, that's right. You see, if you don't have the correct predetermined code, you can't communicate. But friends, codes, I, I can't give you a kilogram of English. It's non-material. You see, the physical world we live in is not just a material world, as we are often told. In fact, to quote uh, Professor Paul Davies, like a supercomputer, life is an information processing system. It is the software of the living cell that is the real mystery, not the hardware. So as I mentioned, all of that information is stashed away on this incredible molecule called the DNA molecule. And uh, it's the most uh, efficient storage system in the world. I'll share a little bit about that tomorrow night. But if you took human DNA it would, uh, and, and wrote out all the assembly instructions contained therein, it would fill around a thousand encyclopedia-sized books. Now, I was sharing with a youth group a while ago and I got this blank look and so I said, ah, oh, an encyclopedia is a printed version of Wikipedia. <laughs> then they got it. <laughs> Friends, if you were to take a single living cell and enlarge it to be the size of a great city like Perth, what you would find would be a staggeringly bewildering array of complexity and high technology. There are communication systems in there, transport systems. There are powerhouses in these organelles here called mitochondria. And inside those are these membranes. And embedded on those membranes is this amazing machine called the ATP synthase enzyme. Now, we're going to touch on a little bit of science during the course of this weekend, and uh, I should let you know in advance that there will be a short examination of at the end. <laughs> no, no, just kidding. Now, you don't have to know what all this stuff means, but I just want to share with you the staggering complexity of what happens inside every single cell in your body. Now, this stuff, adenosine triphosphate it's called, is like the energy currency of the cell. Do you know you can't blink an eye or move a muscle without using ATP. In fact, you generate about your body's weight in ATP every single day. Now, of course, that's not why you're putting on weight, folks. It's <laughs> because you consume it, you use it all the time. But I want to show you an, uh, an animation of what the ATP synthase enzyme looks like. Now, this is based on some amazing imaging technology, which enables scientists to see what the molecules actually look like inside this little machine. Now, by the way, if um, the cell was the size of Perth, then one of these ATP synthase enzymes would be about the size of my laptop. And there are thousands of them in every cell. So have a look at how it works. <laughs> The animated sequence shows the ATP synthase enzyme in operation. The animation is based on an incredible series of scientific discoveries. Only the colours show artistic licence. ATP, or adenosine triphosphate, is the energy currency of the cell. ATP is produced by a tiny molecular rotary motor, rotating it up to 7,000 RPM. These are so small that 100,000 would fit side by side in a millimetre. A current of protons drives the motor, unlike man-made electric motors which use electrons. This portion of the enzyme is where adenosine diphosphate is combined with a phosphate iron in the presence of a catalyst to produce ATP, which is then released, making way for the next cycle. A top view of the enzyme shows the sequential operation. Almost every biochemical process in your body requires ATP. Such a nanomachine exhibits all the characteristics of super-intelligent design. ATP is vital for life, and many of these motors were needed before the first living cell could exist. An evolutionary impossibility. All the assembly instructions for that amazing little motor are all written on the DNA code of um, the living organism in question, in this case, us. So what we conclude is that random processes cannot produce coherent information or assembly instructions, like this inkblot experiment. This is a short clip from our DVD, Evolution's Achilles Heels. So if you flick ink onto a page, this will never happen. And we know intuitively that it will not. 
In fact, Professor Paul Davies again sums it up well. There is no known law of physics able to create information from nothing. You see, friends, we need a whole new law of physics that has to be discovered to be able to do this. So, information is needed. Second thing you need are the correct components. So various subcontracts are let for the construction of the spacecraft. This is the, what's called the bus, the frame uh, being delivered to the high bay where it's about to receive all the equipment that's going to be bolted onto it. There was an experiment, a very famous one, done in 1953 by two guys called Miller and Urey. And uh, what they set out to show was that the basic building blocks, the component parts of life, could happen accidentally. Now, these are called amino acids. And if you take a string of amino acids, then you build proteins. So their plan was to see if amino acids would form accidentally. So here's the apparatus they had. They had uh, um, this, uh, an atmosphere which they thought represented the early Earth's atmosphere. It had methane, ammonia and hydrogen in it. Interestingly enough, it had no oxygen there. And the reason it had no oxygen was because oxygen would prevent any amino acids from forming or destroy any that did. But there's a problem when you have no oxygen, because if the early Earth had no oxygen, it would have no ozone layer. And if it has no ozone layer, that means destructive ultraviolet radiation would reach the surface of the Earth, which would destroy any amino acids what that might form. Also, there had to be a very carefully designed trap to try and extract the products from this experiment. So did this provide evidence of the building blocks forming naturally? Well, not really. Amino acids were produced, but in tiny traces, they were grossly contaminated and they were racemic, which means there was an equal mix of right and left-handed molecules. Let me explain what that means. You see, amino acids are like our hands. Our hands are mirror images one of the other and uh, exactly the same chemical composition with the same physical properties can come in either a left-handed version or a right-handed version. Amazingly, in living things, all amino acids are found to be left-handed. Now, if you had a protein that consisted of, say, 300 amino acids, a modest protein, that would be like flicking a coin and getting 300 heads in a row to be able to do that by chance. Now, I'm not, I, don't, I don't know about you, but if someone started tossing a coin and they kept getting heads, after about four or five, I would get very suspicious and want to have a look at that coin, wouldn't you? Imagine doing it 300 times. You see, there is no way you can form the correct components, these amino acids, through random processes. So we need information, we need the correct components, but we also need to organise them correctly. So when the component parts come, we then assemble them. Here's the, uh, the antenna subsystem being assembled and ready for test in an anechoic chamber. And uh, now this is an experiment, any young people that are here, uh, that you must not do at home, all right? So here is a hapless tree frog, which has inadvertently jumped into a blender. <laughs> Now what we have is frog soup. So in the frog soup, I have all the DNA, the RNA, the amino acids, absolutely everything to make a frog. How long will it be before a frog jumps back out of the blender? It's not going to happen, isn't it? You see, when you've got the bits, you have to assemble the bits. And you know, assembly requires intelligence. In fact, Professor Sir Fred Hoyle, who's not a Christian, a very astute scientist, said, the chance that higher life forms might have emerged in this way, through a chance assemblage of chemicals, that is, is comparable with the chance that a tornado sweeping through a junkyard might assemble a Boeing 747 from the material therein. Now, we all know intuitively what utter nonsense. But friends, it needs intelligence to assemble things. Now, here's a... Uh, a device that uh, you'll all be very familiar with, I'm sure. And uh, it's an example of a system which cannot be made any simpler. Now, this is a concept called irreducible complexity. Now, there are a number of component parts to the mousetrap. Looks like there are five independent ones there. But all five are needed. And if you try and make it any simpler by missing a piece out, it won't work. So here are the bits. And uh, now if I assemble it with a piece missing, who can see what's missing? 
What am I missing there? That little holding bar thing, isn't it? Now, if you use that as your mouse trap, what would you get? Very fat, happy mice, wouldn't you? <laughs> right. You see, without all its component parts, it's useless because it won't function. So you cannot build complex systems slowly, tiny piece by tiny, tiny piece because each of those stages has to be functional and operational in an evolutionary scenario. That's the problem with irreducible complexity. Now, Darwin admitted that if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. And he went on and said, but I know of none. But you know, we have found many, many, in fact, almost every biological system you can find is irreducibly complex. What that means is it all had to come together at once before it was of any value or use at all. Perhaps the classic illustration of this is the so-called bacterial flagellum. It's a little whip-like structure that um, helps some bacteria to move along. It consists of 40 different types of proteins, many, many more than 40 in it, but 40 types, 30 of which are unique to the bacterial flagellum. Now, it's amazing enough to see it operate because this is like a little outboard motor here and this converts a rotating motion into a whip-like motion. But what's even more amazing is to see how it is assembled. So here we have an animation of what happens inside the bacterium. Now these proteins are being made by factories inside the bacterium. They're then delivered to the, uh, the this lipid bilayer which forms the, uh, the membrane, the outer part of the cell. Uh, and here you see proteins coming from the inside uh, up through the central nozzle. Um, and then this next stage of the process, the, the wall of the cell is pierced, but done in a special way so that it doesn't kill the cell. Now, if it should malfunction at this point, the bacterium dies. Now, there's a special little tool that comes out the end here. You can see it's like a little stool, and it takes proteins which are fed up through the centre. It makes that universal joint, the curved part. And then comes another assembly tool, which has five legs, and it then proceeds to take proteins that have come from the inside of the cell up here and then lock them into place in this, it's actually a hexagonal flagellum with uh, a, a five um, part tool which fits them so the, the effect is a rotating motion. So you can see this goes on and builds up the, uh, the flagellum and uh, here you'll see uh, there it is just finishing that off and uh, other ones coming from the other side and the rotating motion then becomes a wave-like motion and that little bacterium can then move. Friends, that is stunning complexity and design. How awesome a process is that? That is for a single bacterium. And then people found this incredible thing. There was uh, a flagella which had seven separate component parts and the mystery was how could you have seven of these things all rotating in the same direction without interfering with each other? And once again, with some clever technology using imaging, they discovered that there were 24 little fibrils in between the seven flagella. And these rotate in the opposite direction so that the seven major flagella all rotate in the same direction. Does that look like it was designed to you? That is amazing stuff. But are wheels possible? J.B.S. Haldane, a very famous evolutionist, said, evolution could never produce various mechanisms such as the wheel and the magnet, which would need to be, uh, sorry, which would be useless till fairly perfect. So I like this image of the scientist here at his uh, laboratory and all this complicated equipment and the equations on the wall, wall there. And he, he thinks to himself, you know, if I can just synthesize life here, then I'll have proven that no intelligence was necessary to form it in the beginning. <laughs> so friends, three of the giveaway attributes of something designed, the presence of information, the correct components and correctly assembled. But do you know what? A monarch butterfly has all of those things and more. You see, the information in the DNA specifies the, the creature, it's the correct components are in the cells, correctly differentiated for the various organs in its body, they're organised correctly. 
not only they organise correctly, but they deliver this creature all the way through the metamorphosis process as it transitions from a caterpillar to a butterfly, all under stored program control in the DNA. You know, that is overwhelming evidence for a designer. But you know, nature can't tell us who the intelligent designer is. But the intelligent designer has told us himself. And he's given us his word. You know, all scripture, the Bible says, is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness. Now, I happen to believe that this book is God's word. Is anyone here with me on that tonight? Yep, another one or two. Fantastic. <laughs> you know, to say that the Bible is God's word is actually a faith statement. It's not something that I can prove to you in some sort of mathematical way, but it's a very defensible faith statement. It's a reasonable faith statement because all the evidence points that way. And when people started to understand that the scriptures were inspired by God and were trustworthy from cover to cover, or as somebody once said, from Genesis to maps, but I actually think they meant from Genesis to Revelation. <laughs> You know, there was one very famous man who came to that conclusion almost exactly 500 years ago. And you know who I'm referring to, don't you? On October the 31st, in 1517, Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of All Saints Castle Church in Wittenberg, Germany. And he based his conclusions, I'm going to summarise them in a moment, on his, the revelation that he received, I believe, from God, that God's word was truth. You know, the, the uh, overarching title for this weekend is God's word, the truth, and our authority in all things. Not just in matters of faith and conduct, but also in matters of science and history as well. But Martin Luther came up with the five famous onlys. The first was, salvation is by faith alone, by grace alone, in Christ alone, on the authority of scripture alone, and for the glory of God alone. Why don't we say those together, right? You want to read them out with me? Let's say them all together. Salvation is by faith alone, by grace alone, in Christ alone, on the authority of Scripture alone, for the glory of God alone. Wow. How awesome is that? You see, the God who created this universe, the divine designer, so loves each and every one of us that he gave us this book. And, you know, without this book, we would have absolutely no knowledge and no way of discovering what happened right back at the beginning. In the course of this weekend, I'm going to unpack a whole bunch more detail in various disciplines of biology and geology and astronomy. But it all comes back to the authoritative place of the Word of God, above man's opinions in every single discipline, including science, folks. Over in the back corner there, we have a couple of tables with some valuable resources on them. One of them is this little booklet, How Did We Get Our Bible? Now, a lot of people are confused. How do we know that the Bible is God's word? Maybe, how do we know it's not the Quran? I mean, some people think it is. How do we know that the Bible is God's word? It's the correct holy book. We need to be able to answer that question. We have a fantastic website with just amazing resources on it. Uh, that's what the front page looks like. There's a new feature article every day. And there's a search window up in the top right-hand corner. You can type keywords into that. And it gives you access to over 11,000 different articles and items of interest, all aimed at encouraging you to have confidence in the Word of God from the beginning. Now, unfortunately, you can't, we, we didn't get everything right. And uh, we've got a rather complicated web address, hard to remember. But I did discover that if you say something at the same time as seeing it, it actually helps to imprint it onto your memory. So I want you to say the web address with me when it comes up onto the screen, so hopefully you'll be able to remember it. So are you ready? If you want to know anything about creation, you just go to creation.com. How easy is that? <laughs> 
So why are we designed? You see, if there's a, d a divine designer, why did he make us? You know, he tells us why. We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Jesus' disciples once asked him, what must we do to do the works that God requires? And Jesus' answer was this, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. How awesome is that? The work that God requires of us is to believe. We don't have to jump hurdles or do amazing feats or, or whatever. We have to believe. And when we believe in the one he has sent, we believe what he has said and what God has given us in his word. And that begins at the beginning. So in the course of this weekend, we're going to look at the beginning. It's significant for the whole gospel message that Christians have to share with this world and to take very seriously God's word, the truth and our authority in all things. Let's just close with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for the gift of your word. We thank you for the gift of your son who came to pay the price for our rebellion against you so that we could come back into relationship with you and to receive eternal life. Lord, we thank you that you love us so much that you left your home in glory to do that for us. Lord, it's our prayer this weekend that we will draw closer to you, that our understanding, Lord, of you and your work as evidenced in the world around us will be deeper, richer, and will give you the glory for what you have done. Father, we just ask for your blessing on the remainder of this weekend, on the sessions that will follow and our interactions. And we ask, Lord, that your name in all things will be glorified. Amen. So let me invite Mark and the team back to close. Thank you.